All right. Well, okay. We turn the right button. It's all good. All right. <laughs> Hold the note. Yeah, you don't want to hear me hold a note, I promise. Um, all right, would you join me in prayer now? Father in heaven, as we gather to open up your word, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for hearts that lead us to seek you. We thank you for minds that desire to know more of you. And we thank you for your word the power that it holds, the truth that it teaches. Bless us now as we look into it. Father, may we divide it correctly. May we see more of you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm going to begin with something that I don't normally do. I'm going to begin with a big, world call, big word called supposition. Are you ready? I'm going to make a supposition here. I'm going to say that there were always supposed to be three crosses. Always supposed to have been three crosses. The only difference is who was supposed to be on those crosses. See, I think the Roman plan was to have somebody different in that middle cross. And that God, using his ability and his power, made sure that there were three, but that that right person was on that middle cross. We're jumping back to Resurrection Sunday or Easter, if you want, for this message. This story is mentioned in all three of the Gospels. And it's the story of Barabbas. Now, I don't know when the last time you heard preaching on Barabbas is, but that's where I'm going. Because I think, by Roman standards, he was supposed to be the third one on the cross. He was supposed to be in the middle. They were preparing for three crucifixions. Christ just happened to come up right away. And there was a shift and a movement. Barabbas is a secondary character, if you want. He's the expendable one, if you were making a movie about this. But he's the secondary character in what we call the Passion Week. But I think it's still worth mentioning. See, if something's mentioned in the Bible one time, it's important. If something is mentioned in the Bible in all four of the Gospels, I think maybe it's still important. God's plan provided, and I'm going to do more big words here now. Ready? This is a Sunday of big words. Are you ready? Substitutionary atonement. And you're going, wow, he swallowed a dictionary this week. No, because what we're talking about is what Jesus did for us. He paid for us atonement. He substituted himself for the sins that we had created. So we're going to look at the story of Barabbas. I'd like you to turn to Luke 23, and we're going to look at 13 through 25. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you 
for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing of de deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, called out to them, called out again to them, saying, But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with, a loud, with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they had requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So we're going to look at this in several little parts here this morning. First of all, the collaboration. Pontius Pilate, his name has become synonymous, if you will, well known with one who allowed the crucifixion of Jesus. He was attending to his duties, but he found himself in a very, very interesting spot. Pilate would rather have not been there. I'm pretty sure of that. It says that three times he tried to release Jesus. We're going to look at this in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But in the history of the world, someone had to be there to pronounce this sentence. Jesus came to die. Someone had to be there to pronounce this sentence, and it fell on Pontius Pilate. So let's not be critical, because if it wasn't him, there would have been another governor. Maybe Governor David, who knows? But there would have been another governor there who would have pronounced this sentence, because the Jews did not have the authority. Now we know, we know they went over the authority several times, but they didn't have it, and they wanted this to be official. And God was saying, it's going to be official. So they had someone official pronounce it. <clears throat> now, continuing on, Pilate compromised. He could have stood strong. He could have dealt with the cynicism. He could have dealt with the lack of respect. But his capacity to rule was being jeopardized. See, one of the things we can sometimes forget is Pilate's in a bad spot. Because he's got rulers above him who don't really care for him. He's got people below him that he's ruling who don't really care for him. And here he is. He's the governor in the middle. And he's trying to make people that don't want him to be there happy with him and trying to make people who don't want him to be there happier with him. He's stuck. And Jesus comes to him. Jesus is brought to him. He admits three times, I find no fault with this man. He wants to release him. Three times he tries it. And then, abandoning his own conviction of the innocence of Jesus and listening to the crowd, it says he gave them over, to, gave him over to be crucified. Pilate found no fault with Jesus for a very simple reason. There was no fault in Jesus. There was nothing he had done wrong. They couldn't find one 
single problem with him. They made up stories. They lied. But they couldn't find anything wrong with him. So Pilate is correct when he says, I find no fault in this man. He was perfect, unblemished sacrifice of God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 with me. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, something else we need to look at, too, is Pilate was not alone in this. There was compliance. In this regards, Herod and Pilate together. When Pilate couldn't figure out a way to release Jesus, when Pilate thought, I got a way to get out from underneath this, I'll send him to Herod. He's from Galilee. Hey, Herod! Got a problem for you. Well, Herod and Pilate didn't like each other. It says they were in enmity to each other. They didn't like each other. Until Luke 23, 12. After Jesus meets Herod, and Herod sends him back to Pilate, it says, that very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other. Or previously they had been at enmity with each other. So they didn't like each other. But now they got a common problem. Well, what will draw people together? You can draw people together with common problems or common successes. They had a problem and they didn't know what to do. So they took their problem and said, well, we're going to give it to the people. And they gave Jesus up. Neither one of them knew what to do with this predicament. Anger, devotion, they can bring people together. Now, we get to the custom here. And this is something we don't know anything about. I'm just sharing with you. We don't know anything about this. I, I researched this a little bit, and there's not a lot written about this. But it says that Passover, the governor was to release one prisoner whom the people wanted to be let go. Now, Pilate figures, now this is my chance to get rid of Jesus. But the people call for someone else. So after custom, we have the criminal, Barabbas. Notorious, apparently, because the people all knew his name. Guilty of murder, insurrection. He's literally a political terrorist. Okay? He is not the guy you invite over for lunch. He's, he's a murderer. And it says so in Scripture. So we have one perfect one without any sin. And we have Barabbas, a murderer, insurrectionist, terrorist. And the people cry out for Barabbas. The cry, the crowd cries for the crucifixion of Jesus the Christ. When Pilate declared that he was innocent of the blood of this people, look what they said. Matthew 27, 25. Pilate says, I am innocent of the blood of this man. They responded, and all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Pilate sought to distance himself from the cross. And still, he 
condemned him. He gave the sentence. As well as the Jewish people of that day, the leaders, the Romans, and if you want to think about it, not very abstract, every single sinner ever born. We all bear a price in putting our Savior on that cross. We continue on now to the crucifixion. And that's the culmination of this story. But there's a little bit more we have to look at. Because we have to look at two criminals who were also on the cross. Three crosses, remember. Three crosses. The difference was who's in the middle one. Barabbas may have been a friend. He may have been known to the other two that are... And I said may. May have been known by the other two that were being crucified. They could have been a group of three. We don't know. But what we know is there were three crosses being prepared. There were three people who were going to go to death that day. The difference again, the one in the middle. See, the thieves are part of this resurrection plan. The Lamb of God is led to the slaughter. He's in the middle. And there he would die with people that he came to save. We have two very different perspectives here. I'd like you to look at Luke 23, 39 through 43 with me. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. All three of these men are going to die in very short order. They are going to come and break the knees of the two thieves so that their death is hastened along, so that they die quicker. Jesus, being God, gave up his life when it was time for him to do it. But before they die, one taunts Jesus. One is saying, hey, hey, come on now. Get us down from here. If you're something special, save us. His concern? Himself. Not looking at anything else. The second thief. And remember I said we had contrasts here? One wanting to be saved. And the other one, knowing he deserved to be where he was at looked at the Son of God and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, I believe the thieves knew they were going to die. I think they knew. I mean, you don't go to the cross for any other reason but death. They don't hang you there for a couple hours and then take you down. You go to the cross to die. These thieves knew they were going to die. The one, the one said, Lord, remember me. He saw something in Jesus. He knew the innocence of the one that was dying with them. 
he maybe, maybe heard the crowds crying, crucify him. He may have been in a cell not too far away. But he knew the innocence of the one on the middle cross. One taunted, while one in humility and belief trusted. When he says, Lord, remember me, he knows something greater is coming. He's going to die, but something better is going to happen. The story of Barabbas, I have to be honest with you, is our story. He was the first person to receive Jesus' atoning sacrifice. So we're not told what became of Barabbas. Scripture doesn't record it. You look him up in history. We're not told. I hope that he became a believer. I hope he learned who took his place. I hope he understands what Jesus did for him. But what Jesus did for Barabbas in taking his place, Jesus did for every single one of us when he took our place. He needed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ just as we need the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We needed that. Remember those big words, substitutionary atonement? Well, we needed that. And he did it. I truly, truly hope he understands and knows what Jesus did. Now I'm, now I'm going to tell you, I believe no matter where he wound up, he understands. He knows what Jesus did. But I'm really hoping he got it and got salvation. See, Jesus traded his life for ours. The story of Barabbas is us. Jesus traded. Have you accepted the one who has traded for you? Christ did it. And he did it to make salvation so simple. We can, we can wrap salvation around big words. I can use substitutionary atonement. I can use redemption. I can use big words all day long. But it comes down to it's very, very simple. Jesus died for us. Because God loves people. We need to understand this and not, not just understand it once or twice a year when we talk about Easter or resurrection, but understand it all the time. Jesus died for us. We are closing, singing song 375, I gave my life for thee. And we're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4. And as we do this, I encourage you, if you have never accepted Christ as Savior, maybe you're watching it on your computer and you've never chosen Him, to now choose Him. To choose life and life eternal. We all stand. ...bringing to the Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with bringing gifts to the Lord, but what He truly wants is your mind and your heart. He wants your love. 
And first and foremost, when he has that, everything else will work out. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for the sacrifice that you gave. Thank you for your son who was willing to go for us. Bless us and be with us as we serve you, as we worship you, as we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.